There he is. <laughs> uh, oh, you're wearing the ball cap today? You don't want to show off the lock? You don't want to show off the uh, the lettuce? Horns up. Basketball basketball uh, team gets going this week, so I'm giving it, showing a little love. Plus, it, horns, it, horns. It, it, was, it was daddy day today, so it was a little rough. So I had okay. to throw on the cap. But, uh, yeah, like you said, a lot to talk about, and I'm glad to be back with you, my man. It's been a while. It has been a while. Well, I, I welcome you. I welcome you, sir. Uh, I don't even know where to begin. I have a list of things uh, that we could talk about. We could start off light, and then we can get into, uh, you know what I mean? I don't want to bombard you too hard. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but we'll start off light. So um, let's just talk about the positives right now. The Bills are 6-2. and two. Mm-hmm. Uh, We haven't been uh, this successful uh, this late in the season since 1993. Do you? How old were you in 1993? Was I was a, I was 11, and actually, so I remember my first Bills memory, well, my, one of my first ones was standing around my grandmother's living room uh, during Super Bowl 25 when the field goal went wide right. That was, a, that was a tough day in the city, man. Like, it's, that was four years. I tell people all the time, that was four years of just unbelievable, um, just chemistry in the city when it came to a sports team. I mean, everybody... Yes. That's all anybody ever talked about for four years. And now it's been, what, almost 30 years of just, damn. <laughs> and and, and I'm, I'm looking away from the screen for a reason. Because 25 years ago is a long time. Yes. Okay? I was, what, 9, 10? I was 10, 10 years old. 25 years ago is a long time. Let me tell you what was trending in 1993. You ready for this? Jurassic Park. <laughs> okay? I'm talking about Jurassic Park. Uh we let's go let's go back. Barney was trending Ooh, for crying out loud. That's how long ago, folks. There's some people right now that's like, what? Who? Barney? Never heard of it. Right? <laughs> Beverly Hills 90210. That was trend. I was trending. How? That's a long. Got milk. Remember those commercials? Yep. Yep. Bro, too long. Too long. Anyways, I don't want to go through the list, but come on, man. That's been a long time. So it's just it feels good to be six and two. Um, I saw something earlier that said, would you rather be uh overrated six and two team or very good two and six team Mm -hmm. i'll take the six and two any day and what's funny about that i saw that you guys put in your ig story that that quote from the the browns uh beat reporter that was on the local radio show about how the the browns would love to be a a bad six and two team right now because let's be honest they're not a very good two and six team right now so (laughs) you know a lot of there was a lot of hype around baker mayfield and everything like that and I think that, you know, overall what you're seeing is slow progression at certain spots. Uh, a few guys that have kind of hit the, hit the ground running in 2019, I think there were question marks around John Brown coming into this offense. What was his ceiling? What was his kind of floor? Devin Singletary, they, they, they uh, reached a little bit by all accounts in the third round to draft him. They moved on from Shady McCoy, and he's come in here and just been absolutely dynamite. Every time this dude touches the ball, it's – it's showtime. I mean, it feels okay. like, you know, I, I, I will never compare anybody to Thurman Thomas, but I don't think that there has been, you know, it, it's a small sample size, but I can't remember the last time where it felt every, I mean, LaShawn McCoy was really good. I, I, yeah. I don't want to take away from that by any stretch, okay. but you're, you're getting this guy at, you know, entry level, you know, as a rookie, you, you potentially could have this guy for the next five, six, seven years. Yeah. He's, he's a special talent and you got to be excited about, the things that are worth being excited about. He, he's definitely a special time. Now, I will I will have to pull you back a little bit because Buffalo has been uh, – they've been um, a team that they don't shy away from getting runners that could really spark something, right, from going back to Willis McGay. Every time he touched the ball, there was something that could happen, right? Travis Henry, when he touched the ball, there was something that could happen. Fred Jackson, you know what I'm saying? So – I'm not taking away from what you said because Devin Singletary, there's something special about him. There's no question about that. And the last time we had something special that you knew that anytime they touched the ball, if it's not LeSean McCoy, it was Thurman Thomas doing his thing. So mm-hmm. not to take away from that, but uh, Devin Singletary, a, a special talent. And here's my question. What the hell took the Bills so long to get him into the game? Now, before you answer that, because you might have a little bit of insight into that. Now, I, I hear, the, hear the excuses I hear. He's not ready because he doesn't know the playbook. True or not, I don't know. I'll let you touch on that. It's not true. Oh, he's still nursing an injury. So uh, 
we just need to give him more time. Or here's the best one that I always hear. We're going to run Frank Gore into the ground, and when Frank Gore's tired, then we'll put Sing Singletary in because he, they're trying to rest him because he had a lot of touches in college. My goodness. So mm -hmm. any, can you shed some light on any of those, any of the reasons and what the real deal is? You know, I think that I go back to when they signed Frank Gore and some of the language that Brian uh, or that Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott used about him, the um, reverence that they have for him as a football player. And listen, Frank Gore is a goat, man. He he's a future Hall of Famer. Fifteen thousand yards—that's no real. Question. I mean, he passed Barry Sanders. I mean, that's that's just something that you gotta you you have respect for in the building. No but question. when you don't want that um, that those feelings towards Frank Gore to kind of blind you at you know the obvious, which was get Devin Singletary on the field. Now, he was only back a game or two, and, and they flipped the switch real quick, so I'll give him credit for that. Uh, but we're also talking about a guy that I know this is a – it's still a little soon uh, since the Nathan Peterman debacle for you, Rico. Oh, but – <laughs> This is a this is a dude this is a this is a guy Sean McDermott that went to uh, you know Nathan Peterman for you know God knows what reasons uh, time and time again so there has been some inconsistent decision making at the top and I think yes. that we could talk we could talk about Brian Dable we probably probably will but one of the big takeaways that I have is from this offense I know a lot of people aren't happy with Brian Dable is but. This thing is run how Sean McDermott wants it to be run. The identity of this football team, how he wants this offense to operate, that comes from the top, man. And, and Brian Dable's doing his best uh, to kind of get things going in a direction, in a consistent direction, week in and week out. They're hitting some snags along the way. I think there's guys that aren't catching balls. There's guys that are uh, committing silly penalties. Lee Smith, I'm a big Lee Smith guy. As a journalist, I get to go in there and talk to this guy, and he's a great interview. But, man, the penalties have just been brutal. So yeah. I think it's just been way too quick with the trigger uh, on Brian Dable. And, and I tweeted it the other day, like the fire Brian Dable movement is absolutely just mind-boggling because it doesn't I, make I a lot of sense. I was on that train last year. Very much so. I was the, the I was I was the juggernaut on that. I had to pull back. Sometimes you gotta admit fault and say, you know what? Maybe it's the E word. We weren't executing what needs to be put together. Uh and mm -hmm. it seems as though that's exactly what's happening now because I see some really good play calls coming from Dave. I see some head scratches as well. I'm not gonna mm -hmm. leave them without any fault, but a lot of execution issues is what's happening right now. My man Pierre put out a video on YouTube today uh saying, guys. Let's pull back on blaming Dable for everything he does. He breathes wrong. Fire Dable, right? I used to be there. I had to pull back a little bit. Um, but I'm glad you shed light on that because in this in this locker room, you've got to you've got to do things to help this team out, right? Uh, and to lay blame uh, on on specific coaches, this, that, and the third uh, is is odd to me. But you mentioned something that I'm very curious about because I've had this question in my mind for a long time: How much say does does coach mcdermott have on the offensive side of the ball and how dable may want to run certain plays is he handcuffed because that's a valid question we all know mcdermott is a conservative type of cat sometimes he does things that are like out of ordinary but we know his true self is conservative how much is he holding dable back and could he be you know, I wouldn't frame it like that because I do get the sense from just even hearing Josh Allen talk about his relationship with Brian Dable and how he kind of gives them freedom. And Cole Beasley has told me this as well. They have the freedom to kind of mess with the game plan a little bit. If they like a, pl a play, uh, a, a certain play that maybe Brian Dable doesn't have in his scheme, he'll add it and he'll try to run it in practice and see if it fits. So I think that there's a whole kind of operation going on there with the the players, if you will, in this offense and Brian Dable. But I just think identity-wise, like what Sean McDermott wants them to be uh, might conflict a little bit at times with what Brian Dable can I, do. I and feel that. that. That could be a problem long-term, but right now I think that objective number one, and I think that they hit the ground run. They went out and they signed all these guys in free agency. They made a couple draft picks. And they started the season, and you and you saw them. They were passing the ball a little yep. bit. It was a little Absolutely. bit more loose. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden, Josh Allen threw those three interceptions against New England. And I think Sean was based – and I don't know this, 
But my my feeling is Sean went and said, whoa, let's dial yes. this all the way back. Because this if we I mean. don't, things can get a little bit dicey at times. And now you've seen kind of game manager Josh in the last four weeks. And this is what is conflicting with fans, right? Because when the turnovers are coming, I'll be one of them because I hate the turnovers. I mean, we all hate the turnovers. Don't get me wrong. But when the turnovers are coming, we say, Josh, Stop trying to be a hero cat, right? Don't be the guy. Don't be that dude, right? The last few games, he's been more of a game manager, right? Just taking what the defense gives him. Now we're like, yo, why are we airing the ball out? I wanted them as well. So mm-hmm. it's we have to, as fans, kind of calm ourselves down a little bit. But when we see things that are so glaring and we're like, why aren't we? It, it, it makes you wonder how much the head coach has something to say about it. Because when you look at the defensive side of the ball, we were getting gashed up by – Adrian Peterson, the Adrian's Wonder Future Hall of Famer, right? Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. you can't scoff on that man. He's going to be who he is. In the second half, we bottled them up. I wonder if McDermott was like, all right, give me that play sheet. I'm going to start calling plays. <laughs> I wonder, right, if it's some, potentially happening on the offense, he's the, he's the head coach. It could be happening on the defense. Could it be? Yeah. No, I, I still think Brian has uh, pretty much control of that. Um, offense, and I think that they really do try to emulate the New England model. I, you know, there's not a lot of times when Bill Belichick, I think, is running over in the offensive huddle and trying to steal the playbook away and, and start running things. Um, but I think that, you know, one thing I'll say for Brian in that, you know, this is my first NFL gig, so I haven't been in other locker rooms and seen other offensive coordinators and that kind of relationship. But these guys, even the guys that just got here, you know, the Cole Beasley's, the John Browns, they they want to sell out for this guy. Like, there there's a real belief in his creativity and his okay. ability to put them in a position to make plays. And that's half of the battle. This thing, man, when you're running out there 11 on 11, it is a mental game of warfare. Yeah. And if you don't have that belief, if there's any question marks, you know, when you go out on the field, like, you know, man, I don't, I don't really believe in what this guy's doing and what, he, what, what plays he's calling. That's a real problem. I don't get the sense from anybody in that locker room that there's even a hint of that. And you, you can look over at Cleveland. I guarantee you I, I'm looking forward to maybe popping in that locker room after this game sun, uh, Sunday in Cleveland and seeing what they're saying about Freddie Kitchens, yes. the, the mad genius that was, you know, being heralded as the next big offensive mind in the, in the league last year when Baker was having a nice run. So – I think that, like, the cool thing about this 6-2 and two start and, and, and the offensive kind of lull that, we're, that they're experiencing is that there's so much room to grow. And I know. It's an interesting thing that they're doing. They're, they're almost d- dialing Josh Allen all the way back in. Now let's see if they can kind of let him go a little bit in some of these games. And maybe that fourth quarter, Josh, you get him for four quarters at some point. And I and I'm I'm with you, and I want to add to that because I have a I have a theory, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tweak my theory because of this new information that I've received from you. Um, and before I get there, should friends chill on this whole fire table thing? They need to chill, do they? Chill it, chill out. Chill. Listen, I I get it, I get it. Like if you're unhappy with play calling, I, I sat on that couch, I sat in that seat in the stadium years ago when when you watch bad play calling, like or what you perceive as bad play calling. But let me. Give you a little secret. Most of you, no offense at all, me included, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, I don't know. I'm not an NFL caliber coach. I mean, like, some of us, I think, some people, and I was a fan, like a real passionate fan at one point. I get where you're coming from. Yeah. But you got to just realize that, like, you know, if these guys aren't getting the job done at some point, they're going to be held accountable. I never thought that this team would trade Zay Jones. I just didn't think think it. In, in year three like this, I didn't think they would be so up to move on so quickly from this guy. I just didn't see it. And what happened? They move on from him. So I think that if there's a point that this thing isn't progressing and they're not seeing the things that they want to see out of Josh Allen or this offense, there's a lot to be happy about with this offense. Did you know, a little stat for you as yes. well, the Bills' offensive line is currently ranked by football outsiders as the number one run-blocking offensive line in the NFL. Do you know who the top three teams in 2018 were? The Patriots, the Saints, and the Rams. The three best teams in the NFL last season. So 
There is good things happening here, and you can't you can't play it both ways. You True. can't say that Brian right. Dable's a, a bad offensive coordinator, bad play calling, and then not give him some props for that because yeah, he has it. a big piece of that. Yeah, I, and I and, and I and I and I'm glad you brought that up. By the way, I like how you said no disrespect, but you're right. We don't <laughs> know. You don't want to cuss it, but I will. We don't know shit. We don't. <laughs> however, however, this is the fault of the NFL and the tools that they give fans like us, right? And I was thinking about this today, and I'm so glad you brought this up because this is organic. I was thinking about this today because you read the filth on Twitter, right? And people might think my tweets are filth as well, right? So be it. That's the that's the beautiful thing about Twitter. You like some stuff and you hate some stuff. But here's what I was thinking today, right? The NFL gives us fans the opportunity to go and get the All-22, to read up on everybody's articles, to watch the film and rewatch this. And it gives all the tools for us fans to know what's happening on the field. You can't fault us for having our own opinion and seeing certain things. 100%. Right? So I'm thinking to myself, sometimes it's a good thing because there are things that fans and, and people in the media, small media, big media or not, that we bring attention to into the media and it makes changes. It mm-hmm. really does. They must have been hearing the fans say, we're the is Singletary. 100%. What and another that? thing I'll say, too, is, you know, those guys over at Cover One, that they're going in-depth in some of this film stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I saw that Pierre video uh, that he put out. Uh, yep. You know, there's a lot of people that know what they're talking about. So I don't want to, like, gloss over that. For sure. For but, sure. like, I, w- I just want, like, you know, Joe Fan that's sitting in their house, like, all upset to just, like, you know, relax a little bit. Just enjoy that 6-2. and two. It hasn't happened in 25 years. If the train falls off the tracks, Trust me, head over to nyupinsyracuse.com because I'm going to be writing all about it. Listen, before we even continue, ladies and gentlemen, if you guys are just tuning in right now, there's 108 people right now that's tuning in. I am here with Matt Perino from Buffalo Bills NY. Up, boom, boom, we know that. Um, Tuning in, and we are talking Bills football and all the things surrounding it. Um, So um, I I wanted to get into this point, and then I'm going to get into my notes because I've got some things that we want to talk about. So I got to thinking. Josh Allen is a different quarterback than he was last year. He's, mm-hmm. he's definitely improved. We all know. We've all seen it. He has mm-hmm. his moments of going back to old Josh. But for the most part, he's been a different quarterback. Um, and and we see it. You said something like maybe like five minutes ago that you said, it's like he's bottled up. We're not letting him you know, be who he really is, right? Mm-hmm. So they got me thinking. And I was talking to Pierre and the whole group chat, right? And we're looking at the offense this year. And Josh, the interceptions that Josh have Josh has thrown have been, except for the one in the Jets game where it bounced off of Cole Beasley's hand, right? Um, and maybe another one that was got deflected. All his interceptions have been him attempting to go deep, mm-hmm. right above the uh, beyond the twenty five yard mark. Okay, so the New England game, we we'll use that as the mark. We're like calm that ass now. <laughs> so ever since that game it's been hit the only intermediate stuff things that are there you don't have to go for the home run josh it's like a bottle of pop that you've shaken and you put it down and he's ready to go but to like sit and chill and see what's out there and i feel that there's this conflict right now between quarterback and the plays that are called not that they're bad plays but he wants to air it out and use his tools so much but they're saying calm it when the hell are they going to let him just go yeah, it's I mean, that, tough, it's a tough question to answer, but that, I, I think it's a good question. And first of all, respect for calling it pop and not soda. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I know you're out there in Canada, but that's 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 a one stuff right there. That, that, that's why you're my man. Uh, I like but that. so, no, so I think that you know, he has I think it could be all season that you hit, you get this version of Josh Allen because mm-hmm. they want to maximize this schedule. They want to try to make a run at a playoff spot, and then maybe even win a playoff game. And I think in Sean McDermott's mind, and even Brandon Bean's mind, the talent level on this team, I don't think they believe it's necessarily there to compete with the elites of the elites in this league yet. That's why I, I don't think they went out and overpaid for a deal at the deadline. I think that that's, you know, this has been a slow process since they got here. And so now I think that if they can get a season in with Josh Allen kind of, Working on that short intermediate pass game, Rico, going into the season, what he's done from a completion percentage jump was, I, I was told, Huge. was impossible. 
by, by the experts, by the critics. You okay. know what I mean? This was a part of his game that wasn't supposed to be this advanced at this stage, if ever. So okay. I think what they're doing is they're, they're incrementally developing him in certain areas. And, yeah, the default was there pretty consistency, consistently last year in yes. the second half of the season. And, obviously, Robert Foster, that's a whole other conversation that I've been having on social media the last, like, two we'll weeks. We'll talk on that. Because I'm with you, man. I, 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 I'd like to see a little more of him. But I, the more I've gotten to think of, about it, Sean McDermott's praised him. He's talked pretty highly of Robert Foster. told me last week he had a really good week of practice. I saw him talking off to the side with Robert Foster after a routes on air rep where Foster just blistering speed in and out of his break, un, unreal athleticism. And I think Sean pulled him over and said, damn, that, that was special stuff okay. to watch. You know, And so I think that there's a good – rapport there there's a good thing going on there but i think there's almost they're kind of waiting i think i think that they're they know how easy this schedule is and i i, I like your tweet like they're playing with their food a little bit right that's what they you are. said mm-hmm. right i almost think they're playing with this schedule a little bit they know that the intensity isn't there in a lot of these games because these teams just aren't very good you saw it against washington that team was never going to score a touchdown in that game i mean with dwayne haskins at the, at the helm i mean I, I just think the secondary is way too good. Tredavious White is playing at an all-pro level. I saw that there was an article that came out and said that he was an all-pro at the halfway Absolutely. at the halfway point. No question. You know, so they they have a lot of things going in their favor. I just think with Josh, I think they're trying to build his confidence and get him to a point to experience what safe, you know, minimal mistake football feels like and looks like. That's another thing. This yes. guy needs these reps, man. Yeah, he needs he these reps. Coming from Wyoming is a completely different world. He's in a whole new world. Every time he, he goes back to pass, he's he's logging things in his brain that are completely different that he's able to then, you know, go to when he faces situations in the future. So I think he's still, even 20 games in, a very raw so talent. And uh, But I, if, I, if I were you guys, man, that fourth quarter Josh, that's a real thing. And I, and I think that's – that's promising at the very least because, you know, you get to the playoffs, you need him to make plays. I think when Tyrod Taylor was here, sometimes you know, wondered if he can make them because he, was, he played the game so safe. At least you know Josh has that in him. See, the one thing that I, I, I love about Josh, skill aside, he, he has a fire. And to, to, to last in this league, any league, first of all, you have to have fire. You don't have no fire, boy they'll put that little dim light of yours out crazy. He has a raging fire that I feel that once he hones his skill, it's going to be, it's going to be something. Um, And you might be onto something. Maybe he, we're peaking. We've peaked too soon. Right. Uh, Meaning when I say peak, uh, we're at six and two, people still don't believe in us. And manager was like, yo, we didn't expect us to be here, but we're playing well. We're being coached. Well, let's run with it. Right? And that's why I didn't make any big moves. Now, I'm going to segue a little bit. We talked about playing with the food and the schedule. We have a schedule that is favorable to us the rest of the way. I think the teams that we're facing are something of the nature of an updated version. I think they're 7 and 29 or something ridiculous. I can't remember exactly what it is. Um, the next three games are against the Browns, the Dolphins, the Broncos. Do you see wins in those three games? I do. I do. I think the most dangerous game is this one coming up because I think you have a team that it could go one of two ways. First of all, it can go continue to go like it's been going, a team that doesn't really seem to have any direction, a, a lot of talent, but not a uh, cohesive uh, idea of who they are as a football team. Yep. I think Baker Mayfield has regressed, regressed quite a bit. I mean, I watched him in that Denver game last week. And he's, he looks uncomfortable in the pocket, real jittery. I think part of that is that he's behind an awful offensive line. And Bill's fans know we're all about that from last season. You know what I mean? I'm so, telling you. <laughs> so, but, I, I but another thing, too, is it's funny. Denzel Ward, uh, the knock on him coming out was that he was kind of a soft tackler. And the same knock was, was on Greedy Williams uh, that they took out of LSU. So they have yep. two cornerbacks who have great athleticism, great ball skills, but they're not very physical, and you see that. I mean, there was a couple times, the Noah Fant play last week, nobody in their secondary tackled. So I think that if you're Sean McDermott in this game, you go into this saying that we are going to beat them up 
in every phase. The toughest matchup that's going to be there is this Bills offensive line versus their defensive line because they have some real ballers. I mean, yes, they do. Miles My- Garrett is no joke. I mean, he's one of the best in the league. And Olivier Vernon's banged up, so he may not play. But if he's healthy, he's also very good. So this offensive line has been playing pretty well. But I will say, too, as good as they've been in the run blocking game, they have not been as good in pass protection. They're actually ranked, I think, by Football Outsiders 29th out of yeah, 32 not, teams. We're, we're That's got to improve. That's got to improve. I, I expected a lot. I'll say this. I expected a lot more coming from Ty Seke and Cody Ford on the right-hand side. Um, I see improvement in Deion Dawkins on the left-hand side at least the last two or three games. Uh, you may see it differently. I, I feel like he's definitely not um, – he's on his point. He's not – Turnover. I mean, excuse me. The penalties are, are are have regressed. He's he's on top of his his game. But that pass blocking, ah, uh, I expected a lot more from that. And I think that's what's holding a lot back from this passing offense, is mm-hmm. the time to pass. Uh, now we have the Browns, Dolphins, Broncos. I see three W's there. A tough one against the Browns, but I think we take it on the road. I think we'll be focused and ready to go on the road. A dysfunctional team. Maybe they come together, but I think their woes may continue. Then we face Cowboys, Ravens, Steelers. That's a tough three games. We've got the Cowboys. We're away at the Cowboys. We're home for the Ravens and away at the Steelers. How do you see those three games going? Do you remember uh, a Dallas Cowboys game? Maybe it was 12, 13 years ago. I think it was Monday night, and they were the Bills were just blasting them on Monday night. Yes, and, I do, and, and I Dallas. was there. Okay, okay. Uh, I was actually with my um, – I'm, my wife's doing her work off to the side here, and we were in, in, our, in our old house uh, before we moved to Vegas, and we had, like, 30 people over at the house, and it was just one of those deflating moments. So I'm looking at this Dallas game, and I'm like, it's a different team. It, it's a different era. It's a different – it's completely different. But as a Bills fan, I understand that that hesitation with those big moments, those when the, the eyes of the nation – are on this team and on this city, usually they don't th- – this team they doesn't don't perform up. well. Yeah. So I, I think Sean McDermott will have them show up. And, and one good thing is about this Dallas Cowboys team, they've actually they're, – they're the similar to the Bills. They have five wins this season, and the combined record of the teams that they've beaten is only like 11 or 12 wins also. So they've been beaten up on bad teams as well. So that will be an interesting one. I'm not a huge Dak Prescott guy. I know he's having a great season. Um, I, I – I think there's limitations, and I think if he goes up against a good secondary, his passing numbers will kind of come down back to earth a little bit. Yeah. And I think that Josh Allen could have some success against the Dallas secondary in that game. But I think that looking forward, the most important thing is, like, if you can get to 10 wins in this AFC, and it, it, it looks like a cakewalk to 10 wins at this point. I mean, the Miami, the Jets, the those are – three games. Exactly, exactly. So – you know, I think the biggest gift of this year, too, is Ben Roethlisberger, Andrew Locke, completely out of the equation, right off the jump, has completely changed the dynamic of the AFC. And I think, like, if they could shore up this run defense, you know, I, I yes. you're going to have to pronounce his last name, Leggett? Leggett? Leggett. They signed him today? Leggett. Corey Leggett. There you go. I mean, I got you. listen, man, I, I saw some of the, the, the film you guys put out today, and he looks – he looks like the potentially the real deal, and a guy that come in can come in here that has some success in the league that can kind of learn under Sean, like Sean McDermott, Leslie yep. Frazier, and yep. you know guys like Jordan Phillips and Star Latulule, who's been in this defense now for Star for three years, Jordan for two years. Man, Jordan Phillips last year, people sleep on his how important he was to Back this daddy. whole defensive line last year. So I, I like the signing. I think they need to make some adjustments, but I also do want, I, I mentioned to you uh, in our pre-show yeah. chat, I, I don't think people, I think people are sleeping on how, on Ed Oliver. I think he's played a lot better than people think okay. this season. You brought it up. Let's talk about it. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about it. So uh, before we do talk about that, I'm afraid of the Ravens run game and the, and the Cowboys run game. I'm, a, I'm deathly afraid. But we're going to say this is a perfect segue because that interior defensive line has been the liability the last three games. So we brought in Corey Legion. We moved up. Um, uh, I got a, I got a little. Vincent, Vincent, Vincent Taylor. Excuse me. Vincent thank you. Taylor. There you Vincent go. Vincent Taylor. Um, so now we've got a stable of defensive tackles, right? So Ed Oliver, our number nine draft pick. Okay. Here's a simple question before we get into that. 
when you draft a player in the first round, what is your expectation of said player? I think that they come in and solidify their position in the first season to the point where, A, you can count on them, and, B, they're making plays. Um, and I think with Ed, the the tough thing is, you know, I think he – I just retweeted it right before we started the show that he <laughs> re, he actually clapped back at people a little bit with uh, – re, he retweeted uh, his pressure rate. And he's winning, you know, in his one-on-one matchups, I think 19% of the time, which ranks third in the league among interior defensive linemen. When you watch the, the, the film and you go back and watch how he looks on tape, there's time that he's getting blown up a little bit. You know what I mean? That, yep. You know, the size looks like it, it seems to be an issue on plays. But there's other times when he's absolutely destroying guys and it almost feels like he's, like, just a half second too late on a play. I know. Or, you know, uh, you know he gets moved off of his – um, his ba- off balance, and he ends up eating eating the grass, and it's and you're, you're sitting there like, wait, man, what's he doing there? But he's he's doing this thing where he's trying to fit into the Sean McDermott defense, which is is kind of nuanced in a way for a defensive lineman. Even the three techs, I feel like from everything I've heard, uh, again, I'm a very amateur with this, but yeah. everything I've hear I've heard Leslie Frazier talk about at Oliver is that he's doing exactly what we're asking him to do. There's a lot of times, even as the three technique he has to fill a, a specific gap so yep. that Tremaine Edmonds and Matt Milano or, or Lorenzo Alexander can make a play. And I think that there hasn't been enough discussion about the shortcomings at that second level, which I think that those guys got to start showing up and making tackles and, and, and making plays as well in the run game. See, my, my, my man Pierre says, Oliver's hustle is what stands out uh, to everyone, uh, and he never takes a playoff. Now, I think the misconception now that's out there is the run – Two things. The run D has taken a bit of a hit the last three games. Then you hear Ed Oliver gets pushed to the bench. I don't want to call it pushed to the bench because they all get rotated in and out, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, Jordan Phillips has taken over as the guy that 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 is is now up there now. So it's, it seems as though he's been demoted, mm-hmm. whether true or not, but that's what's out there. So I think that's what people are talking about now. Let me go more specifically into this because I asked you a question about a first rounder. Is he giving us enough for a first round pick right now? That are, are we? Ex- I, I expected more. Let's just put it that way. But the fact that you said I'm doing what coach tells me to do, or coach is saying we're he's doing exactly what we want him to do, right? But why did we bring him here to eat up blocks or to create pressure and get after the quarterback and and create something? Now maybe we're being too harsh. But at a top 10 pick, I expect more. Is it wrong for someone like myself to expect more? I don't think not so. Not at all. Because no, a top 10 pick is a pillar in your franchise. That's a difference maker. I don't want patience from a top 10 pick. Unless you're my quarterback, that's the only time I want pressure. Now, this is not to say Ed Oliver's trash or anything. He is not. I'm thrilled about Ed Oliver. Ed Oliver. I think he's going to be fantastic for years to come. But at this juncture, I expect a little bit more. You feel the same, or you're a little bit indifferent? No, I think that that's that's fine because I think the discussions we were having going into the season is this was going to be a guy that was bringing constant chaos yes. to offensive backfields, and yeah. there hasn't been a lot of that. Uh, just because you know, whatever you want to say, they're 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 going away from him on a play, or he's a half second behind, or sometimes he does make plays in the backfield, or there's penalties. There's a whole collection of things, and you got to remember too. He's only playing 50% of the snaps. Sean McDermott rotates it. So for Tremaine Edmonds, who's out there the entire game, it's a little bit easier to collect highlight reel plays because he's out there the whole time. Now, with Ed, one thing that really stood out at the beginning of the season that I didn't really account for going into the season was that he didn't take it seriously enough that he wasn't going to be able to come in here and just dominate guys. You know what I mean? He... I think, he, you know, guys t- started talking to him when he was going to training camp, and they said, listen, you got to really pay attention to fundamentals, technique. Every little thing that you do, every decision you make in that split second matters if you're going to land, if you're going to make an impact. And he kind of just scoffed. He told me. He scoffed it off. He was like, man, I didn't take it seriously. And then I got here, I'm like, damn, that, they were right. And okay. so now he's trying to – he's taking it seriously, and, but you also wonder – and I, and I don't want to accuse him of anything because I haven't talked to him about this, but right. is there a, you know, 
Is he taking other things seriously? Has he been in the weight room enough? He's a huge dude. He's a, he's an he's an animal. I mean, he's he's built. But you you look at say uh, you know um, who's a good you look at Aaron Donald, the guy that he had sure. his his closest comp. When he takes his shirt off, dude, that dude is sculpted. I mean, you could just see the work he does in the gym. Yeah. With Ed, it's not so much that, and, and maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe he doesn't. And need it's to not be a slight that. to him. It's just what it Exa- is. Exactly, it is just what it is. So I think that. His case, because he was coming in and having to deal with some other things, how he's going to fit in this defense. He was. He, they asked him to play nose tackle in college last year on a position. So now he's yes. at three tackle, which he's played, but yeah. he's he's doing something new at the NFL level. I just think that there, it was a perfect recipe for a slow start. But I think now this next sample, this next sample of eight games, you're going to be able to really dig into the evaluation on him a little bit more. So bringing in – now, what does it do for a guy like – in your opinion, what does it do for a guy like Star? I, I honestly had high hopes for Star this year. I thought he was going to be the X factor in terms of creating uh, opportunities for others to make plays, him eating up the blocks and let others just eat. But it seems as though uh, Star has – I mean, Vincent Taylor coming up, now Star has become relegated to nothing. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know what to say. What do you, like? What are your thoughts? Your, the, the insider information. The problem with Star Latulale is his contract. He's here through next season because the dead money hit with getting rid of him. I mean, it's just it's a non-starter. I mean, he's here. Not to mention he's a, one of those glue guys that Sean McDermott talks about. He's one of those guys in every room. He's a quiet leader. Um, guys really love him in the room too. Um, you know, I was pretty low on Star too, and then I went back and watched the game after Joe B put out his All-22, which defended Star quite a bit uh, in the Eagles game. Yeah. And, you know, I saw a little bit of that. Again, I'm not even close to that level of understanding game film, but there's certain things that you could just see, you know, if, you know, if he's getting beat off of his block. If he's being asked to take up space and he's losing that, that matchup, then he's not, that's not an effective player. Right. Absolutely. So, um, but I think that, you know, it, it's a, it, it really is a front problem. You know, this, deep, this run situation is a front problem. There's not enough pressure on the outside. Trent Murphy, even when he gets to the quarterback, you saw it last week, he's not finishing. I mean, I, and I get it. Like, the sack numbers, I, I really respect Leslie Frazier a lot. And I, I like what he said about that. Sometimes it's about getting the quarterback off his mark because yes. he's going to end up making mistakes. Well, guess what? The Bills aren't even in the top 15 in the league in takeaways at this point. They're not getting turnovers. Their turnover differential, even with Josh Allen not throwing in the interception the last four weeks, is only minus one. You know, they, they got to be better in that area. If you're, you, are, you have a head coach, and this is where Sean McDermott deserves some, a little bit more right. pressure. He's a – no, pressure. I, pressure I, I think – yes. I think that people need to be talking about the fact, as good as his secondary is, they're not turning the ball over. They're not um, – he is a – Exactly. He's a specialist. He, he, he played uh, a defensive back. He, you see him working with these guys, and he's done a great job with them. Tredavious White is all world at this point. They oh. have arguably the best or second best safety combo in the NFL. Yep. But you gotta, when you have an offense like this that at times gets a little slogged out because you have a second-year quarterback, uh, not a ton of weapons, some guys that are still trying to fit into their roles, a uh, Robert Foster who seems lost, um, and a running game at, at times, they weren't even using Devin Singletary. You've got to pick these dudes up. And, and I think that they need to make uh, some more plays on the defensive side of the ball. And, and not to mention the, the edge rushing. Uh, the one person that, that doesn't – where the hell's Jerry Hughes, man? <laughs> uh, it was, I mean, it was a tough goal that for that dude, man. A lot, I, I expected a lot from him. And in all, in all seriousness, I expected a lot from him. I know he's a great run defender. Right, but what we want from Jerry is the pressure and the sacks. And mm-hmm. I felt with the addition of Ed Oliver, with Star eating up, with Trent Murphy coming into a second year on the team, this is the year that I mean we get old Jerry back. Mm-hmm. But Jerry's not looking like Jerry, man. He's more looking like Jerry Springer. What's happening? <laughs> and what's really puzzling and maybe even concerning is that he's had some real like, you know. I'm going to eat type matchups. Like he's gone against some bomb left tackles over the course of the start of the season. You you go back to that Cincinnati Bengals game. They had Cordy Glenn out. They had their backup right tackle over at left tackle. And and Jerry Hughes was, you know, I I don't even remember him from that game. So go ahead. Go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. 
the, the, the thing that's people watch film. They watch film. And that's what that's what these players are paid to do. Watch the film, practice, produce on the field. And when they see the same old moves from Jerry, they know what's coming. Dip on the inside, push them out. Let me spin on the inside, wash them in, and it becomes, okay, we got it. So when these second-tier tackles are handling, and you're like, come on, that can't be happening. I was happy that he got a sack last week, but I need more from Jerry, man. I do. I need more. I think we all need more. I, I, I agree. And, you know, it it also is a little bit of a disappointment that Daryl Johnson ended up getting no snaps last week. Uh, he's a guy that coming into the season, there was a lot of excitement about if you could cash in on a seventh-round pick like that that's producing or contributing in their first year, that's big nice. time. But I think that, you know, you you get to the grind of that first season, you know, it's not really he, – and he's made some plays at times. Like Daryl Johnson, I, I, I've, I've looked out and be like, oh, okay, a sack or a batted down ball or, you know, a big <laughs> tackle for a loss. So uh, it, it might – things just might be slowing down. You know who I really think that they miss is Mike Love. I think he was going to make this team. Mike I think Love! That, yeah, I think he was he was poised for potentially a, a not I want I want to sit here and say a breakout year where he's gonna have 10, 20, 10, 15 sacks or anything. He was working hard, but, man. but he was working hard and yes, and he, he looked like a problem on on that uh yeah. you know left side. So I think Trent Murphy, you know, he's got to live up to this. You know, when you get to the quarterback, make the tackle, make yeah. the tackle two or three times this year that they've whiffed both of them, Jerry and like, Trent. So you know what it is? You you, you ever play basketball? No, oh, yeah. Okay, you cross over a guy, mm, you go for the layup, and you miss the damn layup. That's what it. That's what it is. He works hard, gets the crossover, you're right there, and you whiff. And so if we if we played one on one and I dunked on you, never would you still would you still do these shows with me, even if I dunked I, on you after? It would never happen. I'm, oh, what? I'm, fla I'm flagrant fouling you before that ever. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are not putting nuts on my forehead. Not happy. Flagrant foul. Well, I was gonna say. <laughs> The only way I could dunk if we were playing, if we were playing like a six foot ring. Yeah. But still, I got you. I got you. So let let's kind of let's turn a little bit. Mid season grade right now. What mm. would you give our Bills right now? Mid season grade. Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, overall, as a team. Overall, as a team. I'd say an A minus. A minus. And I'd say A minus because I know that there's a lot of. Uh, things that need to be cleaned up. There's a lot of areas of this team that, you know, are, phew, you know, it, they give you pause as you look at some of these tougher matchups. But going into the season, as, as, as good as this schedule looked, I still had questions if they were going to win some of these games, if they were going to do enough in some of these moments to win. I thought that Tennessee Titans game, for me, was a real prove-it game on the road, in a tough environment. Now, yeah. Marcus Mariota is terrible, and he got I benched know. right after that game. Yeah. But you have to go on the road against that defense. You Josh do. made enough plays to win that game. So I think that with all things being considered, you've got a 6-2 and two team with a second-year quarterback who I don't think it is even close to what he probably could be or you hope he could be. Yeah. And you haven't done that in 25 years. I think you should get grades for that. And I think that that's – I think the the person that deserves the most credit in all of this and is Brandon Bean because you look at teams like the Jets and the Browns who went out and they signed some big guys in the offseason. They got Odell Beckham. They got Le'Veon Bell. Yep. But what they didn't do is the nitty-gritty. They didn't dive into their, their roster and really figure out and pinpoint where they need to make adjustments and bring in, you know, uh, ba like – Backups, like we need backups. We need, we need, we need depth. guys that John. Depth. 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 Exactly, John yes. Feliciano was an afterthought when they signed him. He has been arguably that offensive line's most valuable player because of what Feliciano. he's bringing in terms of his play, but also his flex and his toughness and physicality. Yeah. I mean, they really did, a, and, and this is what they've also done well. This is my insider take, if you will. All right, here we go. What, I think the way Brandon has told me and told the media over the course of our interactions with him, how he does his due diligence with how he hires coaches and then how he uses those coaches to build out, build out those positions and those sides of the ball is second to none. He said that when you hire Brian Dable, he hired him because he told Brian told him that he went back to New England in 2014 before he took the Alabama job just so he could spend a year 
as an assistant, not even a position coach, as an assistant, studying the offensive line with Dante Scarnacchia. Just a student of the game. He wanted to learn and be a sponge on the wall and just take all the information in. And he started spewing out to Brandon Bean some of the things that he learned from those uh, from that year. And Brandon Bean was like, this is it, man. This guy's going to help build our offensive line. Then they targeted Bobby Johnson. The first day Bobby Johnson was in this building, he was already starting to work on developing this run game. And, oh, look, look what they did mm-hmm. in Indianapolis last year. Look what they did going to fourth in the league in terms of a, a rushing attack. He's got the Bills in the top ten this year. Yep. And he's kind of the, the scientist behind it. So they're doing a – a great job of foundation building, and I don't even think that they're even halfway to where they're going to be from a talent perspective because of all the money they have and the draft capital that they have going into 2020. See, that's why I can't, and, and, I, and I'm not mad at your grade of A-. minus. I can't put them in the A category because of so much more room they have to grow. Mm-hmm. I give them a solid B. And that's a and that's a that's a good grade because I respect that. Yeah, they're offensively, they're we haven't even unleashed the Josh Allen that I feel Josh Allen can be. He's he's still clay being molded, um, and he's still learning the game. And I feel that Dorsey and Dable are working closely with him to fine tune him. And when he's got the little things down pat, we can then open up the Josh Allen that I think everybody's waiting for. That's number mm-hmm. one. The defense is always going to be solid. I feel that our pass rush could be much better than it is. Our interior D, our interior rush could be much better and stopping the run. But we've got so much room to improve, and we're not even close to where we need to be. A B is perfect. And this midpoint in the season, this is where November football starts. This is where we got to really prove what we're about. We're about to prove to a lot of people. Are we pretenders? Are we contenders? We're about to find out. Speaking of pretenders and contenders, I need you, and I'm putting you on the spot here. There's a cold cellar, and then there's there's the sauna, right? Players that are hot. You got some hot players on this team, and you got some people that are in the cold the cold cellar. Um, who are your – the people that are in the sauna right now. They're hot. They're playing well, and there's their guy. I just need two people. Offense, defense, doesn't matter who you want to put. Who would you say? Well, I think you got to go on defense, Tredavious White. He's okay. just been absolutely lights out. Like, and I think that his ability, and, and Leslie talked about it uh, Monday, has kind of helped Levi Wallace a little bit or maybe even hurt him because teams are kind of going after him a little bit more because they know they don't want to mess with Shadavius White. Uh, and I think when you reach that status where, where quarterbacks and offenses aren't even going after you anymore, you're, you're an elite-level player. And I, I, I think that he is the only – on either side, he is the only elite player on this roster right now in my in my estimation and when i say elite i mean top five at his position in the nfl there's a couple guys that maybe i mean literally you could throw jordan phillips into that conversation now i mean he's leading the league in sacks at defensive tackle he's got more than aaron donald i mean that's real that's that's real production making himself some dollar bills okay because he's gonna get paid this offseason my money is what he's saying right now on the offensive side you've got to go with john brown John Brown coming in here, solidifying that number one receiver spot when I think a lot of people, even with him in the roster, were projecting Robert Foster to maybe still be that number one guy. He's one of only two receivers in the league that has at least 50 yards receiving in every game this year. Every game this year. He's, an, he's, just, he's he, just Mr. Reliable, man. He is. He's on pace for 1,200 yards, man. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unreal. Um, I have to say this, though. Um, when I look at who's hot on this team – uh, John Brown is one that that stands stands out to me. Um, Jordan Poyer, man, that that man, he does not get enough like pr- credit for what he brings sure. to this defense, the identity he brings to this defense. Trey White, yes, there's no question about it. He's 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 hot for me right now. But Jordan Poyer is nice. Mike Hyde is great as well. But Poyer, he he just didn't get that love that I I believe that he really deserves. And I think that this season they need to take care of him. They need to take care of a guy like Jordan Poirier on this team, but you never know. He's gonna, he's, he's gonna get paid. He's oh, he gonna get paid. paid. And it's funny, he kind of smiled at me back at training camp when uh, Kevin Byard signed his deal with Tennessee. Yeah. Yep. I asked, I asked Jordan, and I was like, uh, "What are the numbers we're looking at here, man? Because I know you're trying to get paid too." <laughs> and he kind of looked at me. He's like, "I'm focused on the season right now. He didn't yeah, want to yeah, talk about it, but he, he's gonna get paid." And 
he and and what's so great about what the defense they put together is, and I, I I'm not downplaying any individual here, but I think yep. that they fit so well collectively. They've all been handpicked in a way to kind of fit their roles. I mean, Poyer and Micah more than anybody. I mean, Sean, you got to give Sean credit for that. I mean, he plucked those two guys. He no nobody really wanted their own teams didn't want them, right. and they come in here and change the complete complexion. So, yeah, I think Poyer's a great guy to mention in that hot category, and I will tap myself on the back. One of my bold predictions going into the season, he was going to make the Pro Bowl. I think that's looking pretty good right now. It's looking He's looking solid right now. We, we just got to like, see as Bills fans and, and Bills media, we got to put more attention to him because a lot of times small market teams, things get in the way and they don't trust our record, and, and those things go in leeway. Same going for Trey White. Trey White should be talked about. He is getting some love now, but Jordan Poirier should be uh, uh, very much behind him. So we talked about who's hot. We gotta talk about who's cold. Mm. Anybody stand out to you that's in the cold cell right now? Ooh, yeah. Who is cold? I think I think Tremaine Edmonds is a little cold right now, man. I, I think that you know, you, you go back and watch these last two games, there just seems to be like this moment. Like, first of all, I'll say if you take the the season as a whole, I think there's a lot to like about what Tremaine Edmonds has done this season. Mm-hmm. But you mm-hmm. take these last two or three weeks. And there's moments where he just gets kind of lost in the mix of it all. And I think part of that comes from the fact that he's still just banging the books and banging the mental reps of trying to get accustomed to playing the middle linebacker position. I think sometimes his responsibilities, I still think there's questions when he gets to certain spots on the field. He just gets swallowed up by blocks sometimes. Uh, block shedding has been, a, has been a topic of conversation in press conferences the last couple of weeks. And so... Really, I mean, I think you could probably say Edmonds or Milano, but I'll go with Edmonds because he's the he's the chip. He's the chip on this defense. He's that 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 franchise player that when they they brought out two players at the draft, they brought out Josh and they brought out Tremaine. He's the he's the guy. They they traded up to get him. He's got to be a little Absolutely. bit better than he's been in the last two weeks. And that that's that first round thing. When you're a first round pick, you got to produce. And the one thing that that came out about um, Edmonds coming out of I think Virginia Tech, I believe, is where he came out of is. Two things was instinctively he, he no not great instincts, he, he what he, he's lost sometimes and he over pursues, and it's happening right now where he'll over pursue and leave a wide open gap. You're the middle linebacker, a uh, uh, Luke. I'm not comparing him to Luke Keekley at all, but you won't very rarely see Luke Keekley over pursue because he's in, he's in the books and he knows the stuff. I'm not comparing the two, but you kind of see that. But I'm not mad at that. I was surprised by that pick. But I'm not mad at that at all because mm-hmm. he's a very big cog in this defense. Your middle linebacker, that's your guy, right? Um, for me, when it comes – I mean, you, you have the obvious in Foster, uh, but I'm not going to go there. Um, I'm, I'm, we have a guy on the offense that's being, being paid $6 million a year. And I've yet – you're probably your, – your, your brain is racking right now. You're like, who the hell is talking about? Croft. What is up? I, I'm not understanding what's going on, man. Like, we we have Dawson Knox playing 76, 76% of the snaps mm-hmm. compared to Croft at 20-odd percent of the snaps. I mean, you think that now that he's in – now that he's in the in, – into the, 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 into the motion of the games now, he's three games in, I believe, we, we there would be some kind of game plan for him or at least getting him involved, especially with the amount of money you're paying him. I feel like he's in the cold cellar, and I'm until he shows me something. I, 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 this is one of those. This is one of those decisions that management have made that might not work out for us because now we have Sweeney that was making a lot of noise in the off season, and Dawson Knox is Mister Jabbergannot, Mister Rambo. People love him. Croft is about like on the outside. I hope it's not because there's a lot of potential. What do you feel about Croft? I want to talk about Croft. I saw one comment in here about Cody Ford being freezing. Let me ask you this. If you could go back, not trade up, and not give up those picks to get Cody Ford, would you have drafted Terry McLaurin and been okay with it if Ford was gone? Could you imagine Terry McLaurin in this offense? I would love it. Just a thought. I mean, I there, there, there are mistakes that have been made, I think. You know what I mean? And I think if you go back to last week when McTerm- Mc- McDermott came out and said, you know, we're, we're making responsible decisions now. Oh. Like, this is we're, – we're the responsible ones. You know, there's been some some head scratchers in this regime too. And don't get me wrong. Like I said, the way they've built this, the the attention to detail, there it's been a great job. But you mentioned Tyler Croft. 
I want to bring up, so I went back and watched that Baltimore-New England game because I'm just getting ready for that game because there's so much Lamar Jackson smoke right now, I mean, in, in, in everywhere, that I'm just trying to, like, gobble it all up and see if yeah. I can just figure this all out. Gobble, you know one of the big – you know one of the big – gobble, gobble. I was almost Thanksgiving. That's next. <laughs> One of the big one of the big reasons he's having a lot of success, they utilize all three of the tight ends in their offense. Yes, They're they going to all three of those guys consistently. And I feel like defenses are having a hard time dealing with that three tight end look or that three tight ends that you have to always account for. They all can make plays. And I think that That's Greg Roman. Jeez. Exactly. And but and I wonder you got all these tight ends. I wonder if maybe like Maybe get Lee Smith out of the lineup for one game, activate Tommy Sweeney, and just see if you can maybe get all three of these guys like two at a time and just start running some plays over the middle of the field, get 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 things going. Maybe that'll open things up for Cole Beasley a little bit more. But yeah, I'm with you. Tyler Croft's making a lot of money. Uh, he, you can get out of that contract after this year. I don't think they knew they weren't sh- with all the needs they had to fill. I don't think that they were sure that they can land a tight end in the draft. So I think and, their idea was let's go out and get a guy that can at least be our bridge if we have to wait a year. And and we knew it because of the type of contract they gave him. They gave it to him. Like every game that you miss, I think it was like five hundred thousand dollars you're not getting or something of that nature. Something right. was in there. Right? So I knew that there was something a little off with that. And you wanted right. you want something out of it, but I don't think we saw Dawson Knox. I mean, Dawson Knox is nice, but Sweeney's the one that surprised a lot of people. That I, one I, surprised I, a lot of people. And I'd like to, like, I mean, there hasn't been a lot of success yet with Croft and, and, and Knox on the field at the same time, where no. I thought that they were building towards maybe some success with Sweeney and Knox on the field at the same time. You know, Croft made a couple – and to, to Croft's credit, um, or in defense of him, I should say, this guy is yep. coming off of three I foot know. injuries. You know what I mean? That's so, cool. like, you, you haven't played football in a year. It might take – some time to get back into playing shape and like really like in sync. And plus he didn't get all of mini camp and um, the off season program to build rapport with Josh, Josh Allen. So um, I still think that, you know, Dawson Knox is not being utilized enough. I know the drops, but he's a big time playmaker. I think he should be getting the ball a little bit more. So, you know, that's, that's all the stuff that's on Brian Dable, you know, more so than the, 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 you know, complaining about the play calling, What's the usage of players? Because I think that that's where you can kind of start to, you know, evaluate him a little bit more. Is he using the – like Robert Foster. I saw a comment in here that said, uh, talk more about Robert Foster. Yeah, man, I, I, I don't get it. I don't get seven snaps when and you don't Nicholas. have Duke Williams activated. You yep. don't have Zay Jones anymore. You have Isaiah McKenzie at times lining up on the outside. And he's a slot receiver. Yep. I don't get it because this guy was so – dynamic last year people remember the big plays Rico you go back and watch those games he made some intermediate and short plays as yeah, well he, he wasn't a one-trick pony but anyway because uh, we, we've been on we've got some great nuggets uh we I don't want to I mean if you want to keep going we can but I feel hey, like man I'm just chilling we're good okay here we go see thing is Robert Foster he's a good receiver I don't understand why they can't use him utilize him like a regular receiver put him in the game and and utilize him you can't have him wasting Wasting away. He's too athletic. He's too fast to sit there. Now, this is the one thing I was going to mention. You look at the Ravens, and they have an identity. Run the ball down your throat, and you know it's coming. There's nothing you can do about it, right? You look at the Saints. Saints will dart you all over the place. Hmm. We, as the Bills, I feel we don't have an identity. Are we a run team? Are we a passing team? Are we? Are, can we say we're balanced? What is our identity? We don't have one. Could, and it's it's somewhat of a advantage for us because you don't really know what to to really plan for. Are they running the ball on us today? Are they going to try air attack us? You really got to do your homework. But it'd be nice to know that we have an identity, right? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you see the, an identity with this team? I think that they're arriving on it. And it might be an identity that some fans are frustrated with because I think that you're going to see them maybe revert to, now that they have eight games to look at and they are running the ball so effectively, I think that you're going to see times when they depend on that running game and, and just ask Josh Allen to not make any mistakes. And that, I don't know, if you get down, if there's a couple mistakes early in a game, I mean, look what happened in Minnesota last year. 
you know, they made a couple mistakes, gave Josh Allen a couple short fields. The Bills were terrible, and the Bills, the game was never close. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to, you have to be able to pass the ball in this league. You have to be able to build your, um, your rapport with all of these receivers. And when Robert Foster is not even on the field, seven snaps. I just, I just don't understand it because I think that from everybody I've talked to, there seems to be a belief that that's a, a situation waiting to happen. Foster and Brown on the field at the same time. That could be a matchup nightmare for defenses. So maybe, maybe they're outsmarting all of us. Maybe they're just putting it in their back pocket. They got that 20 from mom and they put it in their back pocket. Like, I'm going to buy something late this weekend. I'm going out Friday night. Well, maybe they're waiting. Break the damn piggy bank open and start using that <laughs> 20 from mom because right now we're in the midway season. We need to tear that damn thing open and start spending that cash and making things happen. Now, uh, not to end it too soon, but I want to know your opinion on um, the positives going forward. Like, what what is it that this team needs to do in order to stay competitive uh, and really make that push to the playoffs? Because we don't want to be the one and done. We want to actually make a, a valid effort. What, what are your thoughts? The most important thing right now, if you, if you went into the meeting rooms on Monday after that Washington game, I think that all focus needs to be on the interior of these, the, this defensive line, that linebacker's room. How do we stop this from happening going forward? Because you're about to face Nick Chubb. You're about to face uh, Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, you're about to face even, you know, uh, Philip Lindsay. Lindsay in Denver. Yes. There's, you're, you're about to go up against some of the elite running backs in this league, and they Ingram, will gash you. Connor is going to be back soon. Like, man. Exactly. And even this week coming up, like, what's Kareem Hunt? What's that, what's that second punch going to look like from, from, from Cleveland? So, you know, and they can run the ball. As bad their offensive line is in Cleveland, they can run the ball. So I think that's, that's number one. You've got you to gotta figure out what's going on there and get things fixed. And I think they will because you go back to last year and there was a, there was a period of time, it might have been two years actually, in 2017, where they were getting beat up pretty good in the run game. They gave up a couple 200-yard games, and it seemed like, they fixed it a little bit. So you hope that you could do that. On the offensive side of things, I'd just like to see less penalties and more, you know, these plays where they're shooting themselves in the foot, these these Josh Allen design runs. If, if I The biggest complaint I have about Brian Dable is when he puts the ball in jo – designs the ball to be in Josh Allen's hands. The guy has fumbled more than any quarterback in the history of the NFL in his first – 17 games or whatever Look, it is looking like daniel jones is what he's yes stop that stop that his 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 cheat code is when he tucks it from the pocket and runs when you design him to get out in space he's going to take a hit most of the time because he like he's just searching for that and he's going to fumble most oh. of the time he's proven it so stop doing that take better make more smart decisions with how you're using your playmakers and i think that you know you'll get more out of them um, off off subject, um, I was paying attention to the Chiefs and former Buffalo Bill LaShawn McCoy mm. has been relegated almost like, dude, he only had like three snaps in his last previous game. What has happened to LaShawn McCoy? I mean, I think it's what was going to happen to him if he stayed on this roster. Oh. Like, I, th oh. I think he would have ended up being behind Frank Gore and, and Devin Singletary. And from the conversations I've had with Frank Gore, he didn't come here to, like, team up with LaShawn McCoy. Like, people, like, get that twisted. <laughs> he came here to be the starter. Like, I'm taking your job is what I came Yeah, to they're friends. They're friends. But he told them, like, I, I, I competed for everything in my life. I want to compete. And he said, we had a great time this summer. Like, we, we competed. We, 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 we talked some, sh some stuff. Like, there was days. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. They talked some stuff. They talked some shit. There was, there was days when it was going good. There was days when they were saying some stuff to each other. So, I think what's happening is that that 3.2 yards per carry last year had a little bit more to do with LaShawn McCoy than I think everybody wanted to admit. And I think that Andy Reid probably has seen it there. They got some young backs out there that can probably do a little bit more with it. But, you know, I still think he's a playmaker if you use him in the right ways, maybe like in a more like reduced role like, they ha like they're having him. And, they hey, maybe they're saving him for the playoffs. Maybe they think that if he's got fresh legs, he can do something in uh, December and January. We'll see. Well, we will definitely see. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, it is Mr. Matt Perino. By the way, before we get out of here, UFC, how would you feel about Masvidal? Mm, uh, wait, street you, Jesus. <laughs> so he, uh, are you, he, he, he wanted that. Oh, he wanted that. He wanted that. He wanted all the smoke. 
<laughs> he wanted to. That? Is he better? Is he a better fighter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a better fighter. And I'll tell you right now. Um, first of all, I shouldn't say he's a better fighter. He's just a better. He's quicker. He he he's able to apply more damage in like those exchanges where Nate like wants to like wear on you for five rounds. Yeah. Jorge Masvidal is just going to come out there and just take your soul in those yeah. little exchanges each and every time. I'll tell you right now, take it to the bank. Conor McGregor is my dude. Like, I, I love Conor. I've been a Conor okay. stan for years. Okay. He wants no piece of Jorge Masvidal. Run away from that matchup. He will get starched in under five. He will get knocked out You're in under five. That? I'm that confident in that. Jorge Masvidal, to me, is the – first of all, if you a little background on him if you want it. He Go was ahead. a street fighter. He came up with Kimbo Slice. So oh, he was shit. fighting on the streets. Like, he okay. was just, like, he's an, a real OG badass. Oh, so he's, he's a dog. Fought, oh, yeah. He's fought in all the, all the different promotions on his way to the UFC. He's fought, like, 70 professional fights. This dude is just a killer that's now just being kind of let out on the world. I mean, he's badass. You know what? I, I don't believe in Conor McGregor. I don't. I think he's a lot of this. And once you – once you lose, I feel like once you lose in the UFC, the gig, the jig is up. People now know, okay, that's what it is to get you. Oh, I got that. But you, I'm not a UFC guy, so you would, that's your bag, right? But I just don't. No, he still got to get that guy that, that whooped his ass the first time. The last yeah, time. it's different. Khabib, and Khabib. he don't want that again either. Probably. <laughs> no hell, no, you don't want that. It's different now for him because, like, when you get that kind of money and fame, everything changes. Like, the, the hunger, the drive to get in the gym at 5 in the morning and run six miles, go spar with a bunch of guys that just want to take your head off because you're Conor McGregor. Like, that just changes a little bit. And you could see the hunger. Like, but when he was coming up, man, the way that he called his shot against Jose Aldo and delivered on the biggest stage in 13 seconds. Yes, he did. I'm sorry. You can call me a fanboy. You can call me a stand. That – that was like that was elite sports right there. Like that's one of the moments that will live forever. And um, but now he don't want a lot of this one. He should go fight Cowboy Cerrone. That'll be a fun. That'll that be a fun be, story. That would. Uh, awesome. But yeah, who you got me going on my the, UFC grind here? I uh, listen, it. man. I see. I see the passion. I see the passion. Who who are the Bills like? If you were to if you were to characterize the Bills as a UFC fighter right now, who are the Bills? Ooh. Ooh, that's a great question. Great question. Um, <laughs> he, and don't make us don't make us a punk. No, I think Ben Askren would be a perfect example. Really? He was a guy that came into the into the UFC undefeated, so he had a good record, kind of like yeah. the Bills have a good record right now. Yeah. But nobody really thought he was going to be able to stand in there with the top dudes in the UFC and, and win. And what's happened? He's gone one and two since he signed with the UFC. He kind of stunk, which is a bad omen for the Bills. So sorry, Bills fans. Like, I'm not trying to put that kind of juju on you. But he's kind of just like a, a guy that um, was getting a lot of hype coming in because of the record. But the record was kind of just fake a little bit. I'm not saying that the Bills' record is going to be fake. I, yo, might you be. Don't explain. I get it. I totally get it. And, and speaking of the record, we end the season with what record? Ooh, great, great question. 11-5. and five. Uh, losses are going to be – three more losses are going to be Dallas, um, Baltimore, even though I, I really think they could beat Baltimore and New England. And I think they could beat New England. So I think it's – dude, I, I think they can go 12-4. and four. I, I think that they have the – I know, I know. I, I, but I just think that I, – I just am not impressed with Baltimore and New England. Like, I – and let me dial that back. What Baltimore is doing is great. Like, yeah. I'm not trying to downplay it, but I think that the more games they play, the more susceptible they are to being figured out. And I think that their defense isn't as good. They're, they're, they're a defense that kind of bends and don't don't break. They have some playmakers, some big defense. hitters. They come yeah, they're blitzers. Of the time. Exactly. But, like, I think you could you can go after that secondary a little bit. That secondary doesn't scare me. Like Marcus Peters makes a play every, every time and again, but, um, well, but we'll see. There. quarterback right there. And also, here's another thing. The, the Ravens, a little stat, never won in Buffalo. 0-2, lifetime. So See, now, this now, you, a, now you're really trying to jinx the damn Bills, man. I hate I'm you. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So you say we lose two to three more games. Yeah, I'm going to say they lose to Baltimore just because that's a tough game. And if they're playing at that level, I'm, I'm going to assume that they're playing at that level. Uh, the Patriots on the road, I can't pick them to beat the New, New England on the road. 
Um, and I see you didn't even hesitate on making them lose to the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, you just because like Dallas Cowboys. That was it. Like we like we talked about at the beginning, man. I just I'm not gonna pick this team to win that kind of game until they win that kind I of hear game. You. I just I hear you. And, and you know what it is, and I'm at, I I predicted that we'd be six and zero to start the season, but we're six and two, and I'm fantastic and I'm thrilled about it. I think going forward, I feel like we can play with every single team. And I gave that B, that B grade because we have so much more room to improve on and that we haven't even tapped into it. Once mm -hmm. we start tapping into it and we can get McDermott and Dable to really hone these guys in and focus down, man, we could, like you said, 12 and 4 is not out of the question. Uh, but we're, we're, I mean, we can easily get 10 and 6 easy. So we need to make that playoffs and get into that push. And then, man, the sky's the limit after that. You got to, you can't, somebody told me, you can't get to the Super Bowl without a car, Right. You gotta get to. You gotta get there. You gotta get to the playoffs first, and then let's dance. And then we want to make it. We gotta. We gotta make it go from there. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, this is Matt Perino from uh, Buffalo Bills NYO. Listen, plug anything that you need to plug right now. What do people look, you need to look for? Any articles that are out there? What do people need to know about Matt Perino and the things that are coming forward? Plug. I'm gonna plug Buffalo Fanatics because I think oh, you guys do. You. I think you guys do an awesome job. And I hit you up today because I want to get back on the IG chat with you because. Listen, man, nobody right now is doing what you guys are doing in the game, and I and I respect that. Whenever people are bringing it like you guys are bringing it, like, yo, you guys are just a bunch of passionate dudes that love this team, and you you built something that, like, is so undeniable from the social media perspective, the fan perspective, and not only that, the players' perspective. I got guys in the locker room talking about Buffalo Fanatics. So it's that, to me, love. as a guy that grew up as a Buffalo Bills fan, like, respect to you guys because you guys started a movement it's super popular, and every time that you guys let me kind of come in here and steal a little bit of your shine, Listen, I'll, I'll we, do it because you guys are awesome. We love it. Let me tell you something. We, I already had a lady in here saying, what's up, handsome? I thought you were talking about me, but I think it was about you. I, I'm telling you, man, <laughs> you're, getting the ladies, you're getting the ladies after you, and people like you. Some, I saw a comment say, what can we do to get Matt Perino part of the Buffalo Fanatics? Listen, man, you guys don't really, you guys don't really know, but he already is part, part Buffalo Fanatics. He doesn't want to say it, but he already is. <laughs> he knows what it is. We don't got to talk. It's unspoken, uh, but it's I appreciate it. For those that want more um, of Buffalo Bills NY up, listen, they got they got YouTube, they got our YouTube channel. Check out the YouTube channel. My man Matt Perino stays after the game. I see it. You stay after the game doing the Twitter chats and doing all that stuff, man. Keep it up. I'll tell you, man, you're one of my favorites out there. You're one of my favorites, and you can grind it up, man. You're gonna be up there soon. I, I know it. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and and you gotta show off the hair, man. People love the hair, man. Every time it's, it's, got, it's oh, not it's, it it's not look it's not looking good today. Let's let's keep that under there. There's, it's been a long day. Let's get something straight. Never in your lifetime will you ever dunk on me ever again. Not happening. I'm swatting that thing against the board. Not sir, you're not having that. But anyway, we just wait. Listen, out there. listen. I probably wouldn't dunk on you, but you couldn't guard my step back, and I you probably not score a point. But that's wow. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you this though. I was a I I I I, I was a defender. So oh, where are you? I was like a Pat Beverly. I'll take I'll take I'll take I'll take so much more pride in beating that ass. Then no, I'm just no, kidding. I'm no, kidding. No, no, no. <laughs> we got to, that's a ball game. That's a ball game. Yep. Next anyway, time you're in Buffalo, we'll that. get it going. We, we got to do this again. Uh, oh, yeah, man. We're gonna Anytime. This again. You know what? Maybe after the Browns game, uh, hopefully we can try to catch it up. I'll, I'll be doing my YouTube thing, but like during the week, we got to catch up because a lot of things are going to materialize after this game, and For you sure. know it is because this For is sure. a big one. Like, it's going to materialize. Sure. People are going to be all over it. We win this game. Um, even though they're two and six record, that still is a statement win. I don't care what anybody tells you, because that makes the Bills seven two, and we are to be reckoned with. We lose this game, you know the chatter is going to happen. Ah, uh, they can't do it. They're not that team. So it'll be very interesting to see what materializes. But I appreciate you, sir. Thank you for taking the time to chop it up. The people love you. We're gonna do it again. Uh, Anytime, I appreciate man. Each and every one of you guys for tuning in. Matt Perino, you are the man. Keep doing what you do. Keep grinding. And these Bills fans need to just relax, right? Just tell them to just relax. Re just relax. And Friday night, horns up, go Bulls. Get that season going, defend that MAC title. Show them a little love for my alma mater. And uh, now it's a big weekend in Buffalo. Big, big game. This is a big game. I appreciate that. Well, listen, have yourself a great night. Go hang out with the family. Go hang out with the, uh, the young lady. And we'll talk soon, my guy. All right, man. Take care. All right. Take care, buddy.